There we go. There we go. So I'm still a little bit sick, but I hope to share with you what little energy and enthusiasm I have left. This talk is going to be slightly different than the one that we did in the morning. In the morning, we looked at a much more fundamental feature of the language, that is classes and how classes are constructed. This talk is a little bit more speculative. I wanted to share with you a dusty corner of the language that, from my research, seems to be almost completely underdocumented, but could be used to model problems in a very interesting way. Um, if I were to ask you guys to shout out underscore methods, I'm sure we could probably exhaust all of them. We get all the way down to reduce x and you know, coerce and stuff that doesn't really even exist anymore. Uh, but very likely one of the ones we'd miss is instance check and subclass check, which are fundamental underscore methods in the sense that they are used in the interpreter directly. They're not underscore methods that have been introduced by some library, like, sub, like um, I think subclass hook. They're actually a fundamental part of the language. So like the talk earlier today, this talk kind of revolves around a couple of themes. Oh, I should reintroduce myself. Um, I don't know how many of you here were in the morning, but um, here's my quick introduction. My name is James Powell. I'm here representing the NYC Python Meetup Group. Uh, this is a meetup group in New York City that focuses on Python, the language, libraries. And we have a lot of activities around or to channel the energy in the city towards the use of Python in industry, in research, in academia. Uh, one thing that we're very proud of is the size and scope of this group. We have two or three events every week. We have big talk events with 100, 125 people every two weeks, hosted by a number of startups in the city. We've been hosted by eBay. We've been hosted by uh, AppNexus. And, and we've been hosted by a lot of big names. We are, if you go to meetup.com, you can see that these are the largest meetup groups in the world that have Python in their title. You can see the biggest one is, uh, I think, a Google meetup group in Mountain View that has 9,000 members. But you can see that it's a a across a broad range of technologies. But if you really look for the meetup groups that are Python specific, you'll see two standing out, the Boston Python user group and the NYC Python meetup group. So I, I, I have at times drunkenly claimed that we have the second largest Python-specific meetup group in the world. And I think that's a really cool and really exciting thing. Um, also, I, I don't know if it's flattering or not, but um, I, some people ran into me in the hallway after the talk, and they said that they had actually run into my blog first and had uh, read some of these posts. Uh, I, I'm quite curious what kind of impression you might get from reading some of these posts. This is a blog that I write. I haven't updated in a while, but once the conference season kind of dies down, I plan to put some of my notes here and to you know, continue grinding on some of these topics. Uh, you can see that the title of the blog is Seriously, Don't Use This Code, and it's at seriously.don'tusethiscode.com. Uh, if you look through the entries, you can see that a lot of these are quite applicable to the title. So you know, I have modeling problems that may be monadic. I have, um, this is one that we'll talk about tomorrow, which is embedding Python 3 into Python 2. And I have some things like, oh, my favorite one is bad answers to interview questions. Oh, I don't have internet access here. Let's see if I can get that up. Where I give you, you know, everybody's done FizzBuzz and done Pascal's Triangle. I give you one-liners for those, which are one-liners in the sense that there's no line breaks, but not in the sense that they won't scroll off the screen. I didn't, unfortunately, blog about the um, Knight's Tour problem, which I had in one line that was, I think, 500 characters long. It was ridiculous with a lot of parentheses. So please, if you're interested in Python and interested in where you can go at the boundaries of Python, please read my blog. Uh, Take note of the disclaimer. This is code that maybe you should use to self-edify, but not code that you should inflict upon your coworkers. Uh, one other thing I'd like to talk to you about is this presentation is given as an IPython notebook. Um, IPython is a really fantastic tool for doing live coding in Python, for doing speculative work, for testing things out. Um, in some ways, it's a little bit nicer than using uh, the standard interpreter. Uh, IPython Notebook is even a little bit nicer than using IPython itself. One thing is, it may be difficult for your platform to get IPython installed. And the solution that I have for you is go to continuum.io slash downloads and download Anaconda. Anaconda is a very complete Python distribution that includes NumPy, SciPy, IPython, um, Matplotlib, a lot of statistical libraries, and it also includes some of Continuum's work, such as Numba. Uh, it's a very, very useful tool for getting up and started with a fully functional 
Python 2 distribution. One thing about Anaconda, however, is it doesn't include a lot of Python 3 stuff. In fact, I don't think it includes any Python 3 things. So for example, the talk I gave earlier today out of IPython 3 notebook, I wasn't able to use Anaconda for it because the distribution didn't include IPython 3. So here is our talk. Um, I called it instance check and user defined type system. Uh, there's some information about me. Uh, I am on Twitter at don't use this code. You can email me at james at nycpython.com. If you're ever in the New York City area, please look us up. I run the NYC Python meetup group and I co-run the Flask NYC meetup group. And if you're ever bored and you wanna see what kind of wild stuff you know, I dream up in my fever dreams, listen, Python is all I have. So you know, I like to grind on it. I don't have much else going on. So you know, at least I do good on it. So if you're interested in, in that kind of stuff, go to my blog, don'tleadthiscode.com. The themes for this talk are similar to the themes for the talk earlier. Namely, one of the themes I wanna talk about is different ways of modeling problems. This comes down to a, th this is a more philosophical or epistemo epistemological point. That is, how do, we, how do we formalize what we do when we are writing software? And the formalization that I've come up with that sits very well with me is the real world exists with unbounded complexity and the interactions that things can have in the real world are beyond that what we can even imagine. We can create models for how things interact in the real world and we continuously find that these models are insufficient in one way or the other. So the classical example that we have is, you know, in high school physics we learn the Newtonian model for kinematics. And then as we advance in our physics courses we realize that at certain scales this model is inapplicable. At the quantum scale, Newtonian mechanics is no longer sufficient for modeling what happens. Um, and we see that these models are not only insufficient at modeling the exact behavior, but they're actually practically insufficient in that technology around transistors and semiconductors would not be possible without a better model than the Newtonian model. In our code, what we are doing is we are taking a real world problem and we are finding a model for that problem. And that model identifies the most important parts of the problem and says these are what we need to get done. We take that model and then we bridge that model to a set of mathematical constructs or programming language constructs. And within the programming language constructs, we try to create a consistent semantic, um, we, we try to create a, a, a consistent set of semantics that solve the limited problem that we have. But the problems that we're solving in software are almost never the actual, an actual model of the real world. So this is maybe a philosophical disagreement with the object oriented programming school where there is an assumption that you can look at objects in the real world and you can write them, you can just have you know, a chair object in your program and a table object in your program. Or the classical example is you have a coffee maker object and a coffee cup object and a coffee maker has a pour method. But you can see that the complexity of these real world objects is far beyond what we even care about. And maybe the better way to model a problem like that would be to drill it down to very exact semantics. Model those semantics from a mathematical perspective and then handle the bridging from the mathematical world to the real world at the periphery of our program. So we'll see a little bit of this towards the end. I think that one thing that we're able to do in Python is to do this kind of modeling using built-in structures. So instead of modeling at a higher level, we model using things that the language gives to us ourselves. So when we look at the protocols in the language, we can see very obvious examples of cases where sometimes we move further away from the language than we have to. One other, one related theme is that I think that we can look at Python as a set of tools for building a large system, as opposed to merely a language on top of which we build the system. In this sense, I think we can sometimes blur the line between the system code that we write and the application code that we write. So for example, in the earlier talk I gave, I showed you a way to build a parallel object system in Python very easily using meta classes. And in that sense, you can create objects that have relationships that are totally distinct from the relationships of standard objects. Maybe you can implement some sort of weird multiple inheritance, or you can forbid multiple inheritance and only do single inheritance. And you can find ways that these mathematical constructs match the problem that you want and build them in such a way that it's not just something bolted onto the language, something more fundamentally embedded in the language itself. Additionally, I'd like to talk about Python as a collection of ad hoc protocols. So we often hear this phrase that in Python, everything is an object. Uh, I was speaking to Nick earlier yesterday and he made a very interesting comment that this is also a, a phrase that we hear in the Ruby community, that everything's an object. But unfortunately, the Ruby guys got it wrong. 
in Python, everything is an object. And the way that we model interactions between pieces of our program is by means of what I like to call ad hoc protocols. So if you look at a very formally, a language with very formal semantics that is built on a very strong mathematical foundation, like Haskell, you can see that the way that the objects interact is specified by category theory. So you can say that there are things that are monads and they match what a mathematical monad might be. And these are monoids and they match what the mathematical monoid might be. And functors have some properties that are expressed in terms of mathematical notation. In Python, we don't have that level of rigor. Instead, we have a couple of <coughs> protocols that say, well, this object and this object can interact in a particular way, and here's the standard for how they interact. And we'll see this when we start looking at underscore methods. Lastly, I'd like to talk about ways that we can change, we, we can figure out better ways to model problems by building better conceptualizations of fundamental structures in Python. So we'll look at some of these new conceptualizations. So the order I want to do this is I want to talk about double underscore methods, the Dado model. I want to talk about common ones and how they get dispatched. Then we'll look at how these relate to this view of ad hoc protocols. We'll talk about two double underscore methods that not a lot of people are familiar with, is instance and is subclass mapping to instance check and subclass check. And then we'll talk about maybe some ways you can use these to model problems that are maybe a little bit more embedded into the language. One thing is, I like to put this at the beginning, this is a Python 2.7.3 talk, so that's our version info, so everything here is applicable to Python 2. I think that probably we won't spend a lot of time talking about Python 3 in this talk, we'll, we'll keep to Python 2. So, double underscore methods, common ones, how are they dispatched? Continuing the sort of examples that we looked at earlier today, here is our monster in our game. So in our mod, we have a monster. And the monster has fields like his hit points, his position, and things like that. And you can move the monster around. And because we don't want the monster to leave the arena, and the arena starts at 0, 0 in the lower left-hand corner and goes up to some number, we create properties on the monster that says it can't leave the arena. And we do something very simple. When we want to print, when we want to view this monster at the command line, we have a little wrapper so it can tell us information about the monster. Um, the class name, the x value, the y value, and the hit points. So as an example, we have, we have a subclass off of monster called dragon, and we have an example of a dragon. Does anybody know what this is from? Yeah, there you go. Now I'll tell you one thing. So I, I, ta I taught some Python classes very recently at a startup, and each class we had a theme. The first class we talked about Star Trek, the second class we talked about Star Wars. I never got to give a talk around Stargate SG-1, so maybe next year we'll talk about the Goa'uld. Oh my, this is on tape too. I can't, oh my goodness, I'm on the internet talking about the Goa'uld. But, just remember, they are false gods. Does nobody watch Stargate? It was on the air for like 10 years. It had three series and a cartoon. Come on, guys. Okay, so this is our monster in our system. It's just a dragon. It has a position and hit points. Nothing special about that. Let's say that we want to do something kind of clever. We want to have a swarm of monsters, like bees or hornets or ants. So we create a subclass off of this called swarm. And we do something kind of clever. We say that instead of having single hit points, it has an array of hit points. Because maybe you can you know, swing wildly into it and you hit a couple of those. And each time you kill one of these guys, he gets removed from the list. And the total hit points is the sum of the individual hit points. Makes sense, right? It's just a, you know, 50 ants and they each have five hit points each. And that's all we've done here. One thing we, we're going to do is we're going to say that, you know, if you're trying to set the hit points, we've added a property on this to say if you're trying to set the hit points, they have to be some iterable. So you can provide the hit points as a list or a tuple or something like that. And that's all we have. So we have our hornets here. Now one interesting thing that we've done is we have added this underscore method iter. And what iter does is it allows you to iterate over instances of the class. So what I can do is I can you know, call iter on hornets. You can see that calling this top level iter function is the same thing as calling this underscore iter function. They map to the same place. And you can see that I can iterate through the hornets. So if I wanted to, I could put them into a list. Oh. Where am I again? Oh, I need to evaluate these cells. I always forget because the IPython notebook will keep the last output, but you have to reevaluate the cells. So you can see each of them has seven hit points. I could also hornet and hornets. I could print hornet, and we get seven times, I believe we had 10, 100 of these. So I can print these guys out individually. 
and we can do simple things like that. That's a simple underscore method that you might actually want to you know, use in real life. We can also say, oh, I got too many of these. Let me remove that. Now you can also say that maybe we want to make it some sort of uh, mixin, an attacker. And the attacker is something that you can call. You can put parentheses after it, and it represents the thing attacking your, your character. And just like in D&D, the attacks that we define are some number of dice, some set number of dice. So you know the attack is 6d6, meaning you rolled six six-sided dice, and that's the total attack. So that's what we have here. This returns a list of the damage, and the damage is something from zero to the individual damage for each number of attacks. So for the Hornet, it may do 70 attacks of small amounts of damage each. Additionally, so we, we, create, we create our Hornets again, but as a subclass, and it's both a swarm with this attacker mix in, and we take in the attacks and the damage. So here we have 70 attacks for 70 Hornets doing, actually I'll do 69, because maybe the Queen doesn't, doesn't move at all. That's a little bit of texture added to the example. No, no one? So, you know, 69 attacks, or we'll do 68. Maybe there's a, I don't know, two, there's always a queen and there's like the junior queens, right? So we'll do 65. And do, they do six damage each. That's a lot, actually. So we'll do two damage each. It's flipping a coin for how much damage they do. Well, no, not really. It would be a D, yeah, it's flipping a coin for each damage they do. There's 70, there's 70 of them and they each have HP of 20. And so you can see when I call Hornets, I get the damage, and you can see that each time, um, the damage is just the sum of the individual pieces of damage, so I can print that out. And we can see, you know, they each, some of them did some damage, some of them they pricked the skin and they pulled their stinger out and they died immediately. Maybe we could model that as well. One difference, so, so one, one thing that you'll notice that we didn't, we didn't have in this morning's talk was, notice that the uh, ultimate base class of this derives from objects. And I said in this morning's talk that since we were in Python 3, we no longer have to explicitly derive from objects. Because the explicit derivation from object is an indication of a new style versus an old style class. And this dichotomy no longer exists in Python 3. I would say that it is probably unlikely for you to ever see an old style class in any modern code that you're running. Any libraries that you're using probably have been updated. And I think pretty much everything important in the standard libraries, well, that's, that's actually not true, but um, I would say that any code that you're writing yourself today probably will use new style objects just because you'll find that they behave as you'd expect and that any documentation that you've read and any answers you've read on Stack Overflow will be written in terms of new style classes. Old style classes really aren't for broad use. But I'll show you one distinction between the two of them that gets to how we actually dispatch an underscore method. So in this case, I have a class called foo. And I just create an instance of it, lowercase foo. And on the instance, I add a member. And it's just a function that returns 10. And when I do length of foo, I get 10. This is one major distinction between old style and new style classes. Whenever we call these underscore methods on a, an instance, in the old style, it'll look up the underscore method on the instance itself. Which means, if I had foo and I had bar, and they were members of the same class, they individually as instance could have, as instance, they individually could have their own implementations of this underscore method. So even though foo and bar are the same type, they could have their own specific implementations of something like len, or something like iter, or something like call. You might be able to dream up of a way to actually use this in production. Probably it's not that useful. The big difference is, what if we try this on a new style class? So we have, a cla we have the exact same thing, foo, doesn't do much interesting, and we try to add a len method to the instance. When we try calling it, we're going to get an exception, and the exception will say foo has no len. The reason is, the underscore len that's looked up on foo is looked up on the type, not looked up on the instance. So in this example, we've added it not to underscore, not to lowercase foo, but to uppercase foo. We've added it to the to the class, and we'll say we'll put a note here to saying this is added to the instance. And here, this works. Additionally, if I had done def len, that would have worked. Um, but we can't actually put underscore methods on the instance. They're always looked up on the type. So we can see that 
another way we could end up calling this length. We can call it by doing len foo. Or if we look at the type and we look up the underscore length on the type, not on the instance, and call it with the instance, that's actually how these are dispatched. So let's talk about, we, we, we briefly covered this, but let's talk about met these underscore methods and protocol. And I think the best place to start is with call. A lot of us come from a C++ or a Java background. And in Java you have this, I believe it's the observable pattern or the visitor pattern. Um, and what that means is you give all of your objects a specifically named method called run or execute or do it or something like that. And as a convention, you pass a list of these objects to a function and that function calls whatever dot run, whatever dot execute on each of those. And it, this, is a, this is a pattern, this is a structure for modeling your problem. And you say, okay, all of these objects that are runnable have a run method and you can just call them on a list of these objects. And, so, and you can have that list including you know, subclasses of those objects and those will also have a run method and so forth and so on. It's a very common pattern that we see in a language like Java. In Python, we can see that we don't actually need to do that. That we're actually building something a little bit further from the language than we need to. What we can do is instead of creating our own ad hoc, ad hoc name method like run, we can just create a method called underscore call. We can make use of a protocol that already exists for us. And so what underscore call really does is it says this object can be invoked. If you had foo.run, that's another thing that says this object can be invoked. But what you're, what you're saying is it can be invoked according to a protocol that you've invented yourself that really only exists within the context of your program, within the context of the work that you've done. It's something that you would have to personally document. Whereas call is a way to invoke a method on an object that is something that's fundamental and seen throughout the language. So this is what I mean by underscore methods and protocols. And we see this as a consistent pattern through the language. I'd like to make one very brief divigation just to say that what I'm providing to you here is an interpretation of the language. And I know that we've all sat through high school English class and somebody was you know, interpreting the man in the sea. And there was a question of authorial intent. And I think that in the, in the scope of an interpretation, authorial intent is actually fairly meaningless. To wit, we can come up with conceptualizations of how the language works based off of what we see and what we observe. We can make predictions, and if those predictions come out to be true, then the model that we've built in our minds of how it works is something that is providing value to us, independent of whether or not the author intends to be that way. So that's my one disclaimer for this talk of ad hoc protocols. I don't know, that, that came off really academic, didn't it? I don't know, I, I, I did my undergraduate degree in comparative literature, well not in comparative literature, but in Asian studies with comparative literature, so who knows. Anyway, another example of this, and you can see that we're, we're gonna see a very common pattern. Another one is a top level method, iter, and an underscore method, iter. And this just gives us an iterable. So we can see the exact same thing. We had some top level structure, foo. And actually in Python 2, the top level equivalent to call is actually apply. This has been removed in Python 3. But you can see that we have this common pattern of some top level, ob some top level function and some underscore method implementing that. And you can think that, that what we've done here is, and there's always a question of why is it len as a, as a uh, top level method as opposed to x dot len, like it is in Java or it is in C++. And I think the reason is in Python what we're trying to do is we're trying to model things in terms of these top level functions and then we're specifying how those behave on the type by implementing these underscore methods. This is an approach that is somewhat similar to type classes in a language like Haskell, but it, it may be a, somewhat thing of a reach to say that this is a type class approach. But you can see that what we've done is we've, we've established that these top level methods and that there's some way that these objects can interact in the context of these top level methods. And we're gonna see the pattern continue. The next one is next. So next has underscore next or in Python 2 it doesn't have underscore. So the exact same thing, we have a top level method next, and we have an underscore method, underscore next, or in Python 2 it's not, it's just, uh, bare next. Similarly, for strings, we have, or for objects that need to be formatted, we have a top level function format and an underscore method format. Think about this, we have a top level method str and an underscore method str, a top level method repr and an underscore method repr, right? And we see a consistent pattern here. For length, we have a top level method len and an implementation of that, an underscore method len. For things like int and float, we have a top level method int that constructs a value we have a top-level method float that constructs a value. 
and we have underscore message, int and float, that can be used to specify how this particular type deals with that protocol. So what I'm trying to push towards is a view that in this language we have certain things that we want to do to modify our object, to mutate our objects, to assert a relationship between our objects. And those are expressed in terms of these top level methods. Like len, what does len mean? It says, well give me some abstract notion of how big this thing is. And when we write our own custom types, we specify what that means in the context of our type. So for example, in a list, that's just the number of the elements. In a dictionary, that's just the number of keys. In a set, it's just the number of the elements. And we see a commonality here. But if you wanted to, you could say that in the example of you know, our swarm, it's the number of bees that are still alive. Because we may elide from our iter the bees that are dead. And see how we have some notion of the abstract length of it, but we have an implementation of it on the type itself. Two underscore methods that we don't talk about too often, or that I think are almost completely underdocumented, relate to the top level methods is instance and is subclass. So we see this consistent pattern. Top level method len, top level method int, top level method uh, apply or iter or next, and underscore methods that correspond to that. Well, we have top level methods is instance and is subclass, and I'll show you how they work. We have well, we have, I don't know if I want to go like that first, but we'll, 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 we'll do this guy first. So just, just as a very brief introduction to how these top level, what is instance and is subclass do, here we have a list, one, two, three. And we say is instance list. We have a tuple, and we say is instance tuple. We have a list, and we say is the type of that list, which happens to be a list itself. See, we've kind of gone around in circles in this example. Is that a subclass of list? and so forth and so on. So that's how these things work. They take two parameters, and the first parameter is what you're trying to check, and the second parameter is either the class you're trying to see it's an instance of, or the, or the superclass you're trying to see if it's a subclass of. One thing that we should be using already in our code is non-concrete base classes instance checks. So it actually is, some people say that you shouldn't use has adder, or you should use has adder instead of using is instance for checking if some input that you've gotten conforms to whatever specification you need. So you should say, if you're going to call a method bar on it, you should say has adder bar. Or if you're gonna call, them, if you're gonna call iter on it, you should say has adder iter. I don't think that that's necessarily what you have to do. And, and later on we'll see that actually the has adder method is subordinate to the is instance method. But if you're using is instance, one thing that you definitely should never do is check against a concrete type if you don't care if it's a concrete type. So I'll give you, a, I'll give you an example. Say we have a function called sum. And sum takes some elements and it just returns the sum. This long form. And for some reason we've written this. Now sum is not a, you know, we could have written variants or we could have written a little bit more complex. But you can see that in this case, maybe we want to have some constraints on what values are acceptable here. So we want to say, okay, we'll do something clever and we'll say, just to make sure that nobody misuses this function, we'll say, I think this is a reasonable thing to do because if you pass in something that can't be summed up, right? Like if you pass in you know, a, a database handle or something that just can't be iterated over to be summed up, it makes sense to flag the, the warning as early as possible. And you may be able to provide additional information as to why that's a warning. But the problem is we've specified that this guy has to be a strict list. So we might try and be a little bit more clever and say, well, maybe I'll let you do a list or a tuple or a dict. And now you can sum the keys of a dictionary or the elements of a tuple or the elements of a list. But what's gonna happen is if I give you some subclass of a list or a tuple, like a name tuple, it's a very common subclass of a tuple, this check is gonna fail. And as you push this towards the, the boundaries, you'll see that we don't really care that the input that we've gotten is a strict list, is a strict tuple, is a strict dict. All we care about is that we can iterate over it. And this is where the collections module fits in. In your code, you should be using elements of the collections module in order to determine if things match the signature that you want, if they, by some duct typing relationship, have the methods that you want. So for example, here we want to check not is x a list, we want to see is it an iterable. And clearly lists are iterables. 
Similarly, you can see this foo object. You can iterate over this foo object. So we could, we could sum up the elements in this foo object if we desired. It's not a list, but it is an iterable or a iteranal iterable. Similarly, if we wanted to see if something was a sequence to, say, to, to make sure that the elements are not only iterable but in a specific order, then we might say, is, is this sequence? And then we could distinguish between a list and a set because a set doesn't have a specific sequence to it, whereas a list does. Sets are unordered. One thing that we can look at when we look at these underscore methods is that so far we're very familiar with underscore methods that exist on class instances, on class definitions themselves. So in the example of our swarm, we had an iter on the swarm. You know, we could have put a len on the swarm to figure out the number of bees that are still alive or the number of hornets that are still alive. I'll show you what that looks like just because I kind of like that idea. So, you know, in a hornet class all the way up here, we might say, Something like that. So these, so th the class itself is iterable. So we get all the HPs out of them. And if the HP is non-zero, then we just sum a one for it. So if all of them are dead, then len will get zero. Now one interesting consequence of this is that part of the protocol on len is that if we put, that it, it's used as part of the, the determination of whether something is true or false. So if we had this object representing the swarm of hornets, and we wanted to put if hornets, what if hornets would use is len. So this if hornet statement would actually mean if any of the hornets are still alive and kicking. And I think that's a very reasonable way to model this problem. And it may be something that's very useful for us to do in our game. We're very familiar with writing instance methods or writing underscore methods at that level. But one thing that we don't do very often is write underscore methods at the meta class level. Earlier today, we looked at simple enum. We looked at a you know, enum class where you could enumerate not, o not over the, or sorry, iterate not only over the instances, or not only over an instance, but rather over the class itself. And I'll show you an example of this here. If I had written this iter like that, then I could have done for x in foo, and notice that's a lowercase foo, that's the instance itself, and it would have iterated over, actually I'm gonna do both. It strikes my fancy to do both. It's my talk, I can do what I want. It's my party and I'll cry if I want to. Remember, anyone remember that song? <coughs> I remember Cindy Lauper, I'll tell you that. So in this case, we're iterating over the instance itself. But in this case, notice that there's a capital F. We're actually iterating not over the instance, but over the class. And you might wonder why is this something you might want to do. And I'll tie this into this view of protocol. So if anyone here has used Django, Django models have, an, have a method on them, underscore fields. And that gives you the fields of the model. And it's something that in many cases you want to iterate over. You want to see what fields this model provide. Why would, you, why would you have an ad hoc protocol where you're iterating over underscore models? Why don't you want to iterate over the model itself? And you can see that in one case, in, in the end, they end up being fairly similar things. But you can see that one of them is kind of building its own substructure, its own system on top of the language. And the other one is using a feature built into the language itself that you can just iterate over things. And it seems to me that it's fairly reasonable to iterate over the class itself rather than to have a special method that you have to know to call to iterate over things. So if this were a model, the, iter the, the iteration over the model won't, won't give you data about an instance. It'll give you information about the model itself. So if it were you know, a monster in the database, it would give you the name of the monster and the hit points of the monster and how many times people have killed it and how much loot it's dropped and things like that. One interesting thing that we looked at earlier today as well was meta classes and this init and new, these init and new underscore methods. And I think a very interesting additional method on the meta class is underscore call. So I wanted to provide this to you just for general information, but any time that you create an instance in Python, it calls the meta class's call. So you can see that we can actually, that these protocols exist at kind of different layers. At the type definition layer, so under class foo, call means whenever you call the instance itself. And under the meta class, it means whenever you operate at the type level rather than at the instance level. So what does this have to do with instance check and subclass check? The reason that we 
don't really have a lot of information about instance check and subclass check is that they are underscore methods that do not exist on instances themselves. They are not defined on the type. They're defined on the meta class of the type. So just like in the example of the iter or the call, you can see that this instance check is on the meta class of dangerous, not on dangerous itself. And this is part of the reason why this is considered to be a more sophisticated or a more obscure feature. That, it, that the feature actually exists in an area where we don't really do a lot of work. There's not a lot of work done uh, building custom meta classes for custom classes. I'll say that this example is, I think, an interesting one. So we said that there are these pairings of top-level methods and underscore methods, like iter and underscore iter, next and underscore next, um, call, or rather, uh, len and underscore len. And the pairing that we'll talk about here is is instance and underscore instance check and is subclass and underscore subclass check. So here, I have a standard is instance call. I have an object that's called, that's a griffin, it's an, it's an instance of a monster, and I wanna see, is it an instance of dangerous? If this were the standard is instance check, what would happen behind the scenes is that the interpreter would check whether or not dangerous is a class which is in the base class hierarchy of whatever class mo uh, monster is. Or, so it would see, is monsters subclassed from dangerous anywhere down the line? But notice something interesting here. Dangerous exists totally independent of monster. That this class here is just an object that derives from object. And there's no explicit relationship between this guy and this guy. Yet, I'm gonna take out this print statement. Yet, this instance returns true. And I'm gonna show you that it does by turning on an assert. And I'll turn this into an assert as well. So we have something very interesting here. We have an is instance check. We have a way to determine if some object is an instance of some type where the type we're checking against doesn't have to have this standard inheritance relationship with the type of the object we're looking at. We can say, is this an instance of a dangerous, a dangerous class? And it'll tell us yes or no based off of the criteria of whether the object has an attack method. You can see that we're actually using has adder here in order to do the, the uh, determination. But we're putting this has adder in a, in a very modularized place. We're putting it behind an artifice of is instance. Which means that if, for example, the criteria for what would make a monster dangerous changes, for example, if the monster needs to have then monsters need to have hit points greater than 10,000. We can change this in one place, as opposed to having to change these checks everywhere we do the has adder. Additionally, one interesting thing we can see is that this is a form of dynamic type checking. It's not static type checking. If I were to create a dragon class, and you see how I put the attack in the init, meaning that it doesn't exist statically on the class itself. There's no way for us to determine that this dragon object has an attack method or it has an attack member until we actually instantiate one and look at it. We can see that this checking is actually being done dynamically on the object itself. So we can call this a form of dynamic type checking or dy dynamic type determination. I will return it. Similarly, we could use subclass check in order to determine whether or not some monster is a subclass of that. So say we create a bunch of monsters in our program. We have dragons and griffins and ponies and unicorns. And we have some determination for whether or not one of these types of monsters fits this criteria of, is it a dangerous monster? Well, we can build that criteria. So maybe what that means is the monster has to have an attack method. So for example, a kitty cat. Well, actually, kitty cats are quite dangerous. Um, maybe a, uh, a baby duck, baby ducks, a Psyduck, because he's always confused all the time. There's a Pokemon joke. Come on, guys. Oh, what's the, what's the um, what was, what was the fish? What was the fish that had a really powerful attack once you level it up all the way? Magikarp. And what's the attack when you level it up all to uh, like 100? It's got a really good attack where it mimics the other guy. Does anyone know? Okay, we're gonna have to all play Pokemon when we go home tonight. Um, but you could say that certain, by some qualities, certain monsters in your, in your game may not be considered dangerous. And there may be some criteria that you judge this on based off of the type. So for example, it may have an attack method or it may have a you know, second chance method, so you kill it and it comes back, or it may have some other criteria. You may also be able to determine this dynamically. Like you can say it's dangerous if it's hit points at runtime or above a certain amount, 
but maybe a, you know, Charmander or Charmeleon or Charizard, once it goes to very low hit points, is considered to be not very dangerous. So what can we actually use this for? We see that just like we have a len method and a, sorry, we have a len top level method and a underscore len, we have call and underscore call, is instance and underscore instance check, is subclass and underscore subclass check. How can we actually use this to solve real problems? So I have a couple of examples for that for you. Let's say we're building a mathematical system. And in that system, we want to be able to say, is this sequence of numbers non-decreasing, monotonically non-decreasing? How would we model that in the type system? It's very difficult. We, we wouldn't we want to create a list and create a sub, you know, we wouldn't want to create a monotonically non-decreasing class that subclasses from lists. Because then maybe we want to have, you know, non-decreasing tuples, non-decreasing dicks. We could have not, well, any sort of sequence. So, you know, non-decreasing streams. So strictly subclassing from lists may not be the right way to do it. Similarly, this is not really a inheritance-based type relation. It's more of a, a duck typing based relation. It's more of a relationship of we look at it and we determine based on the value of it. It's more of a dependent type rep relation. Where we look at the value of the object and we say, based on the value of this object, does it fit into this type? It may be a list, but under some circumstances it may be non-decreasing. In some circumstances it may be you know, a, a list that's you know, moving up and down. What we can do is we can use instance check to say, here's a class monotonically non-decreasing. And we do an instance check, and in the check we do something very simple. We say for all the elements in the object, and all the pairs of the elements, so if the list is you know, one, two, three, four, we look at one and two, two and three, three and four, we check that the first is less than the second, or less than or equal to the second, because this is monotonically non-decreasing as opposed to monotonically increasing. And here's my little n-wise helper that gets pairwise views an object. If you were in the generator's talk yesterday, you'll have seen this before many times. And with this, we can do some interesting things in how we model the problem that we have. Instead of having a function like is non-decreasing, we're now modeling this in terms of a type relationship where we say, is this list an instance of a non-decreasing of a non-decreasing sequence? Is this list an instance of a non-decreasing sequence? Is this list an instance of a non-decreasing sequence? And the answers that it gives us are exactly what we expect. In the first case, each element is increasing. That's good. In the second case, it goes up and it stays flat, but I'm saying non-decreasing rather than increasing, so that's okay. And in the second case, you can see it dips down and it's no longer non-decreasing. So what I could do is, if I wanted to have a system, like a derivative pricing system, there are many cases in that system where I want to have checks that ensure that, for example, yield curves don't get, rather, uh, survival curves don't get inverted. That if, for example, the probability of survival of an insurance contract should decrease over time. It shouldn't be more likely to not default 10 years from now than it is today. And the probability of the default today should always be one. And there are certain criteria on this data that make it valid or invalid. And in an invalid state, we end up with some very strange things happening into our, in our system. What we could do is we could model these criteria in terms of a type system. We could say, is this curve a curve that's non-decreasing? Is this curve a curve that's consistent with some particular shape or some particular criteria around how we calibrate it? And then, in our code, we could replace things like functions like is valid with actual checks that look like type checks. And in this sense, we can see that we're kind of modeling our program in terms of more fundamental entities, in terms of types. Now, why would we want to do this instead of modeling it in terms of, you know, w with the unbounded complexity of just a top-level method? Like, a, we, could, we could easily have written a function that looked like this. Right? We could have easily written something like, like that. And why would we want to do this in terms of the type system? Well, one thing that I think is of benefit in the language is finding the most restrictive mechanism for accomplishing what you want to do and using that. So in the talk about generators that we gave yesterday, we talked about modeling problems using generators. And I showed an example of how you could model any generator using a standard class. So why would you ever want to use a generator if you could use a class? Well, there are some benefits in terms of conciseness, in terms of um, just the convenience of writing just yield instead of having all the boilerplate. But another reason is generators are a more limited feature in what they can do. A class has unbounded complexity. If you have a class object, it could have any sort of internal state and any sort of mechanisms internally that manage that state. And it's very difficult for you to look at that as static code you know, on your screen and predict how that behaves against certain stimuli. 
Whereas, if you had a generator, you know that generators have a very strict criteria of how they behave. You can iterate through them, and as you iterate through them, you, know, you can only iterate through them in one direction. They don't buffer elements, and all of this additional behavior needs to be built on top of it. Similarly, if you were to model your problem in terms of a type system, you can see that you're narrowing the possibilities that you have. You're gaining a little bit of robustness in the sense that you don't have the ability to do as much of the type system, but you can do exactly what you need to do. And by narrowing the possibilities, you may add some additional comprehensibility to your code. So that's my, my motivation for why you want to do this. Another example is you can see that there is, so there is some isomorphism between the different ways that we write our code. So one way that I saw that came up was I was dealing with a simple report that reported over price changes. And it needed to determine whether a price change was a very good price change or a bad price change, whether it was very profitable or very, or it was disastrous. And it, to simply model it, say we have a, a list. And that list has you know, just a bunch of changes. These are just price changes day over day. And each change is associated with a ticker and associated with the yesterday price and the today price. And in my function called performance, I just iterate through that and I have some criteria for determining whether or not that change is profitable or not. And I tag, and I want to return some tag data with that in it. So maybe I want to create my own, maybe I want to say deep, uh, processed changes. And then maybe I want to say status name yesterday. And then here, when I say, when I determine that it's been very profitable or disastrous, I'll just say, we'll do this as a generator, yield process change. Oh, this is profitable. Something like that, and something like this. And so now my processing function just takes the input data and tags it with some additional information. And it's necessary that all of the logic of what constitutes a profitable change or disastrous change be encapsulated in this one function. All that logic needs to be in one place because that's something that's subject to change. And that needs to be defined in this one function. Well, one thing that we can see we're doing is we're taking the set of data and we're adding one additional piece of information to identify what it is. And this is actually isomorphic to typing it, to putting a type on top of it. So one thing that we could do in lieu of doing this is we could just say, so why, not, why wouldn't we do this? And we've, we've ended up getting the same thing, right? We've just taken the exact same data and the information that we've added onto it in our processing function is being tagged not in terms of some additional field, and that field could have unbounded complexity. In this case, it was just a string, right? And that string could be set to anything. So if you were determining later in your program whether or not the values were correct or not, and maybe there were multiple processing functions of this form, you might run into problems where somebody misspelled profitable and a check of profitable in whatever fails. Whereas here, we've actually constrained the possibilities to it either has to be one of these classes or one of these classes. In this sense, you can see that we've ended up modeling the same problem but in a more restrictive way. And we can do this very easily and very robustly using instance check and subclass check. So the last two things I want to talk about are two limitations to this technique. The first thing that you might get excited about is I, I get very frustrated when I have some library and I want to pass data into the library and the library is too specific about what type it wants to accept. So what might, be, what might be really nice is to fake it out, to say, I'm passing you this in, and I'm just going to pretend I'm an int. Unfortunately, if you look at that instance check and subclass check function, you can see that the two arguments they take are the type you're checking against and the object that you're checking, or the type you're checking against and the subclass or the class you're checking. The direction by which you are doing this check is always, it's always the type you're checking against that is able to determine what it is. So in this case, you cannot change the you cannot change int's version of instance check and subclass check. You don't have access to that code. It's written in C. There's no way to patch it. Well, there is a way to patch it, and maybe we'll talk about it tomorrow. But you don't ever want to do that. It, they're, 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 that's really neat. But generally, you can't change that. So what you can't do with this is you can't masquerade as other types. What you can do is you can make your you can make a type accept whatever you want it to accept. 
So I could make dangerous accept any type that I want based on any criteria I want. What I couldn't do is I couldn't force some other type to accept me as one of its own, much like life. Yes, and, and you can see that it's not multiply dispatched. It's singly dispatched on the type object itself. And the second large problem with, the, the second uh, difficult piece to this is, how do you re-invoke the standard type checking mechanism? So this is the last piece I want to talk to you about before we get a couple questions. In the cases of these underscore methods, you saw that when I, when I overrode string, I may have inside the body of that method called string itself. When I overrode format, I may have called format in that itself. And you see there's a very common pattern of whenever you override something, you always delegate back to the standard mechanism. One very common example of this is get adder, set adder, and del adder. In many cases, when you want to use get adder, you do your own little piece, and then you delegate the rest of the problem back to the standard get adder. And you have a re-entry point into the protocol by calling the top level get adder function. There is not, there really isn't a top level re-entry point into the type checking mechanism. And then when you try to do very strange things with this type checking mechanism, like taking an, an established type hierarchy and building a type hierarchy off to the side and having the two interact, you'll find that you need to know a little bit too much about the hierarchy you're trying to interact with because you have no way to re-enter the standard mechanism. So that's instance check and subclass check. I hope you learned something. If you have any questions, let's go for them. In the back. So, so you can see that I do something in this example that you, in these examples that you don't, you can't do anymore in Python three, and that you don't often see. So, oftentimes when people actually write meta classes, they write class meta class and the class that they want, and they do underscore meta class equals the meta class. Personally, I don't, I don't know that that's the best way to do it because you never, I've never really seen a case where somebody wrote a meta class and then reused it in a bunch of different places. And personally, I feel if you're not reusing something, don't put it into a public namespace. So, I like to write it in line so as to hide it from the scope of anything else. That's just my, my, my intention. Now, if you were to write these classes in terms of monotonic non-decreasing, then it would make a lot of sense to put these in a public place, like your own types module. So you could say, you know, sequence types or numeric types or mathematical sequence checks. You could put them in a public place and import them from anywhere in your program. Because you notice that they have no dependency on any other objects in your system. There was another question? Oh. Okay. <laughs>